All right, I know this is gonna seem like a weird question, but imagine if I told you I had two different foods and farming the first food killed 100 animals per acre while farming the second only killed one animal per acre. Which farming method should we prefer? Again, I know that seems like a silly question, but think about it and we'll get back to it in a second because it relates to this idea that vegans should actually eat grass-fed cows, presuming it will cause less overall deaths since animals die in the production of crops. Sometimes it's even said that if you eat grass-fed cows, you only kill one or two animals per year. I eat a carnivore diet, probably 99% of my calories come from beef. I end up eating about two animals a year, right? So am I actually better than the average omnivore because I only cause the direct death of two animals versus the 175, 200 that the average person. Is that a fair assessment or do you say that's wrong as well? I, I don't even think it's empirically accurate that you only kill two animals. The equivalent of two animals. I eat the equivalent. Because you have to include all of the things that are, you have to include all of the death that is entailed in obtaining those. And if you're unfamiliar with this argument, you might think it came from some debate bro edgelord on Reddit. How are you feeling? My central nervous system, that's how I'm feeling. I see. Or maybe an acolyte of Joe, have I told you I'm a bow hunter Rogan? Yeah. Bow hunting, bow hunting. Yeah. Yeah, practice every day. I was out in my yard today practicing. You know what I mean? But it actually didn't. And we'll get to that in a minute. But first, what is this video trying to do? Well, one, to show how ridiculous the idea is that if you only ate grass-fed cows, you'd only kill one animal per year. And two, to challenge the idea that it's just obvious that more animals are killed in crop production than grass-fed cow production. All right, so where does the argument come from? Well, it actually originates from a professor named Stephen Davis all the way back in 2003, drawing on two studies looking at crop deaths of field animals during harvest, one from 1993 and one from 1971. He estimates that the average number of field animals killed in crop production to be about 15 animals per hectare per year. This comes from assuming a population density of 25 mice per hectare and then approximating a 60% mortality rate by doing some sort of proprietary average between the two studies. But spoiler alert, this is not how averages work. The average of 52 and 77 is 64.5. Not 60, but whatever, let's just go with Davis's 60. Anyway, he additionally estimates the number of field animals killed in pasture forage cultivation to be 7.5 animals per hectare per year. So looks like eating crops kills twice as many animals, right? Well, there's problems. First, this 7.5 doesn't include the cows themselves which are killed. Given that an adult needs between 1,600 and 3,200 calories per day, if they were to eat nothing but grass-fed cows for a year, they need roughly one to three cows. Let's call that 1.5 to err on the side of caution for now and because it gives us nine as a nice round number. Also in the study that Davis draws his 52% mortality rate from, this number represents the number of animals that were killed by other animals after the crop was removed. Whereas if we're looking at animals killed by the combine harvester, the number is only 3%. So what's the problem with the 52%? Well, if we're looking at downstream deaths, particularly those caused by other animals, then we can't stop there. We have to consider the animals who would have died if not for eating the mice, per Lamy. The authors themselves note that although cutting down the crops is a disaster for the mice, it is a bonanza for younger owls and weasels, many of whom would die without the food source harvesting makes available. All things considered, harvesting the field might even do more good for animals than harm, as it is possible that many of the mice will die soon anyway. As the authors write, whilst the mortality of the arable woodmouse population at harvest is dramatic, many of the animals killed at this time of year are nearing their natural life expectancy, and it may be that the predation corresponds to a doomed surplus. But we'll touch on this general concept of what would have happened otherwise later. All right, you say, well then no, I wanna only look at more direct deaths. Fine, then for this study, we have 3% or 0.75 deaths per year compared to Davis's adjusted nine. In other words, by this estimation, there'd be 12 times more deaths from grass-fed cows than from crops. All right, well, what about the study from 1971? This study found a mortality rate of 77% or 19.25 field animals per hectare per year. And this 77% does represent animals directly killed by farm equipment. So that definitely seems to be more than Davis's adjusted grass fed of nine animals. But this brings us to a larger problem of the paper. This doesn't make like logic. Where's the logic? Remember that question I asked in the beginning about a farming method that killed one animal per acre versus a farming method that killed a hundred animals per acre? Which did you choose? Was the one animal per acre the right choice? Well, this is like one of those standardized test questions where the answer is needs more information. Let's say the hundred animals per acre method produced enough calories to feed the entire world and the one animal death per acre only produced enough calories to feed one person. Does that change your answer? Well, it should, because this is what we really care about if we're invoking the least harm principle that Davis takes as a given in his paper. What we really care about is the number of animals harmed to feed some number of people. So without factoring in the calories that wheat, corn, soy, or cows produce per year per hectare or acre or whatever, this number doesn't really tell us much. 
So when we factor in calories, what do these numbers look like? Well, first we need to know roughly how many calories are in a cow. And so as not to bore you with a bunch of math, I'm gonna go through this quick and trust that you know how to use the pause button. So first, let's grab this table from my first video in this series showing a cow has about 900 calories per pound. Then let's get three estimates of the total amount of meat in a cow from the Mississippi, South Dakota, and University of Nebraska state extensions. This gives us a range of about 400 to 500,000 calories per cow. Also, this is similar to two other well thought out estimates I've seen here and here. All right, and even though one acre per grass-fed cow per year may be a bit of an underestimate, we're going to assume it for now to make the math easier. Now we need the calories for crops. So in the first study that Davis cites, they're looking at wheat and barley fields. So how many calories can wheat produce per acre per year? Well, according to this source, around 4 million calories per acre, though I've seen higher estimations. So even if we assume the low end of one cow per acre, wheat still produces around eight to 10 times more calories per acre. And soybeans produce around 12 to 15 times more calories per acre. So even if we take Davis's wheat mortality estimate at face value, and we take his grass-fed mortality rate at face value, so 7.5, what originally looks like 1.7 times more deaths in the wheat case now actually flips to around four to six times more deaths in the grass-fed case using his own estimations, which like I said earlier, are a little suspect. Remember, we're just accepting that the weasel and owl lives saved from eating mice count for nothing here. And we're not including the direct deaths of the cows. And also remember, Davis throws out these estimates as a way to make the case for eating grass-fed cows and basically just eyeballs this 7.5 figure. So we have little reason to think that he would be biased towards overestimating that figure. And if anything, perhaps some reason to think he'd be biased towards deflating it. And I'm not even the first person to point this out. In fact, the following year, Gavrik Matheny published this response paper in the same journal. He says, Davis mistakenly assumes the two systems, crops only and crops with ruminant pasture, using the same total amount of land would feed identical numbers of people. In fact, crop and ruminant systems produce different amounts of food per hectare. And Davis suggests the number of wild animals killed per hectare in crop production is twice that killed in ruminant pasture. If this is true, then as long as crop production uses less than half as many hectares as ruminant pasture to deliver the same amount of food, a vegetarian will kill fewer animals than an omnivore. In fact, crop production uses less than half as many hectares as grass-fed dairy and one-tenth as many hectares as grass-fed beef to deliver the same amount of protein. And even if we take the higher mortality rate in the sugarcane study, grass-fed still fails, as sugarcane seems to produce over 10 million calories per acre. But this is a kind of weird comparison since these are truly just calories and nothing else. When we're doing comparisons to animal flesh, eggs, and milk, I think we should generally be using legumes and possibly nuts, seeds, and some grains as comparators. And less so things like apples or broccoli or sugar. This is because apples, broccoli, and sugar aren't likely gonna be the bulk of what is or should be subbed in for animals from a nutritional perspective. So the nice thing about this calorie argument is we don't have to get bogged down in how likely mice are to run away from a combine harvester or thorny philosophical questions like if we should count the deaths of mice caused by birds after harvest. We can just accept Davis's assumptions and watch his whole thesis fall apart. And I know this is a little mathy, but stay to the end and I'll summarize it all nicely, plus include a really important bonus reason. All right, but has anyone else tackled the problem of crop deaths? Yeah, this guy Mark Middleton from Animal Visuals. He also draws on Davis, Matheny, Lamy, who wrote this book, which I recommend vegans read, and USDA statistics to come up with this chart. Also, he lays out his whole methodology here, and it's a pretty short read. So what does he find? Well, these bars represent the number of animals killed to produce 1 million calories, or about a year's worth of food for someone eating around 2,700 calories a day. The red portion of the bar is just those animals killed in slaughter, and the yellow portion represents those killed in harvest. And what do we have here? When comparing to biosimilars like grains, the things we'd actually primarily be subbing in, the slaughtered deaths alone for cows exceeds the harvest deaths for grains. And even if we look at vegetables, all we need for beef to blow past fruits and be equal to vegetables is for 3% of this harvest bar to be associated with grass-fed harvest deaths. In other words, this estimate could have been overshot by 97 percentage points and still not support Davis's case. All right, let's take a breath. I know that's a lot of math and there's something I wanna point out before I move on. This video is in no way a formal life cycle analysis or a peer reviewed study. It's fancy napkin math. But considering I have yet to see any actual peer reviewed comparative analysis supporting this claim that grass fed cow farming results in less deaths than crop farming, I probably would have been justified in simply invoking Hitchens razor here. What can be asserted without evidence can also be dismissed without evidence. But I wanted to see if it even passed the sniff test and that's largely what we're doing here. All right, moving on. Now with respect to grass-fed cows, you might be saying, well, what harvest deaths? The grass isn't harvested, the cows just walk around and eat it. But you'd be wrong. As Organic Valley says in their article, How Are Cows 100% Grass-Fed in Winter? Organic Valley has three pools of 100% grass-fed farms, whose milk goes into our grass-fed milk products, located in Oregon, the Midwest, and the Northeast. 
Most of these farms experience frigid temperatures and snow in the wintertime, and even Oregon has a dry season when pastures aren't productive. So how do our cows still eat grass in the winter? Well, let's let Julia explain. For those of you who have been following us, you know that we're a certified organic dairy farm that ships our milk to Organic Valley, and our cows are 100% grass-fed. Being a 100% grass-fed dairy means that we're able to feed our cows a grass-only diet in winter because all summer long, we are harvesting hay. Hey! Hey, y'all! Hey! Hey, hey! Okay, we are on fourth cutting. I think Dan and Matt are chopping back there. I wish you could smell this right now. Yep, so grass is in fact harvested for winter, and also apparently not for winter if there's just dry, unproductive parts of the year. So if we're saying the heavy machinery going through crop fields is causing crop deaths, it seems a fair assumption to say heavy machinery going through forage fields is also causing crop deaths. But now the question is, just how much harvesting is done for grass-fed cows? And the second question is, how much harvesting is done for a biosimilar like soy? So first let's just pick a middle of the road daily caloric value, say 2,400 calories per day, which would be this many calories per year, and and go from there. Soybeans produce over 6 million calories per acre, meaning it only takes about one seventh of an acre of soybeans to feed someone for a year. So on the soybean side of the equation, we've got all the harvest deaths associated with one seventh of an acre. All right, now how much forage land needs to be harvested to produce the same year's worth of grass-fed cow calories? Well, I'm again gonna ask you to use your video pausing skills here because I'm gonna go fast. So first, I grabbed estimates of how much grass is eaten in a cow's lifetime. Assuming a two-year lifetime, we can then figure out how much grass is eaten per day. Then we take an estimated range of how many days a year a cow would be eating harvested grass, multiply by the total number of winters they'd see, and then multiply that by the total number of cows eaten per person. And this gives us the total harvested pounds of forage per person. And the reason there are so many ranges here is because depending on the farm, the location, the weather, the breed, etc., the cow's lives, how many winters they see, and how much forage needs to be harvested will all vary. And hang with me, we're almost there. Now we just need to know how much dry matter forage there is per acre. This resource from the University of Maryland Extension says it's 2.4 to 4 tons per acre. From there, we convert to pounds and divide by the total harvested pounds the cow would eat for their winters. And that gives us between 0.45 and 2.73 acres, an average of about 1.24 acres, which generally seems to comport with the information from the Texas A&M Extension, which says, a combination of hay and grazing would allow one cow per two acres. When harvest efficiency is considered, this figure becomes one animal per three acres. This is a calculated year-long stocking rate with winter haying. It also comports with what this farmer says here. I wound up having 41 5x5 bales out of 15 acres cut, which is a pretty good take. It's about a third of what we'll need for the winter to feed our 35 head of cattle. So remember, for soybeans, the amount of field we'd need to harvest would be 1 7th or 0.14 acres. That means we need to harvest between 3 to 20 times as much grass field to feed the cows a person would eat. And this doesn't include the grass that cows forage themselves. What that means is just to break even on crop deaths, the amount of deaths that occur in harvesting pasture would need to be three to 20 times lower than the crop deaths that occur when harvesting soybeans on a per acre basis. Soybean harvesting, in other words, would need to be three to 20 times as deadly as forage harvesting, which is a weighted average of about nine times as deadly. That's a pretty high bar. But that, of course, wouldn't be counting the deaths that occur in pasture agriculture, not for winter or the deaths of the two cows themselves. So even if harvesting soybeans cause nine times more crop deaths per acre compared to forage, eating grass-fed cows would still cause more deaths because we'd have to include the cows which are killed, plus all the animals killed by the cows, plus all the animals killed to protect the cows. And in fact, at least one farmer in this post from Our Farming thinks that mowers for grass hay silage production are way more lethal to bigger wild animals like rabbits and deer. This year has been better than before, but I normally kill two or three baby deer and a couple of rabbits each year with the mower. Also, I calculated for three to four months of winter, since this represents a fairly normal length of time to be cold and get snow and is at least cited here. But, but the Oregon State Extension suggested something more like six months, which would make this number even higher. And of course, not every place is gonna have dry periods or winters, but this is gonna represent a substantial portion of grass-fed cow farming, particularly in places like the UK, Canada, and the United States. After all, something like 65% of Canada's landmass has annual snow cover for more than six months 
per year. It should also be noted that when harvesting hay, the farmers don't just go over the grass once with the mower. They go over it again when they tet it. Principal reasons for tetting hay are to shorten the drying period for the hay. You're just trying to get it spread out for maximum solar exposure. And then again when they rake it. Raking at the right time will speed the rest of the drying process. It pulls the hay off of the ground so that air can get through the windrow. And then again when they bale it, and then again when they load and move the bales. Plus, hay apparently provides a unique fire hazard. This guy, for instance, hit a rock while mowing and started a fire that burned an acre of his hay. We were cutting some hay two days ago, hit a rock, started a fire, and we burnt about an acre of our grass hay. We were pretty worried about that. We ended up calling the fire department, and neighbor came with his water tank, and I was spraying it down with our four-wheeler sprayer. But even hay that's fully protected from these renegade rocks presents a fire hazard. But I'll let this farmer explain. What can happen if you bale the hay a little too wet is fermentation can start to occur in the middle of the bale, and that fermentation's byproduct is heat. Bales can actually get hot enough to start on fire if they're too wet and that fermentation happens. And here's some hay that got really out of control. There's not enough water in the state of Oklahoma to put this fire out, but the fire is probably going to burn for a week inside the barn before it all burns down. A week? Is that normal? Is that common? I mean, all you can do is just let it burn. So yeah, it takes a while. It has to burn completely down to the ash. When you compact hay like that, alfalfa hay with moisture in it, and then you stack it tight in the barn, it can cause it to spontaneously combust. So not only are these fires going to kill a lot of small animals, they're also going to reduce the efficiency of hay production, meaning more deaths per calories produced. Unless you think these are just some super isolated cases from YouTube, here's a bunch of articles written by University State Extensions on the issue. And here's an article from Nationwide Insurance that says, hundreds of barn fires happen every year in the US. And in many of them, hay bales are the fuel source for what's almost always a major property loss that can also endanger livestock and farm workers. Also, I know I've been focusing mostly on harvest here, but pastures are also seen seeded, reseeded, tilled, fertilized, and have pesticides sprayed on them. Here's a farmer seeding their pasture, and here's some agricultural extensions talking about it. Here's a farmer fertilizing their pasture. So your fertilizer is going to provide the nutrients necessary for the economic growth, whether you're grazing or whether you're producing hay. And here's some agricultural extensions talking about it. And here's a farmer using pesticides on their pasture. And here's another one. We found army worms in a section of our hay field and thought, oh man, we may have a pretty bad infestation of them, but wasn't sure. And we walked out through the field and oh my, my, we are covered up in them. So we rented this to, uh, to spray to kill them. And right now we don't have another choice. It's either that or they're gonna eat up our whole hay field. And here's some agricultural extensions talking about it. Not to mention, pesticides are also used directly on livestock to control flies, ticks, lice, mosquitoes, etc. And here's some videos showing that. Bovi rub works by requiring cattle to pass underneath it, and by doing so, rubbing a dose of insecticide on the animal. Once the insecticide is applied to the bovi rub, or the back rubber is charged, it is hung in high traffic areas, generally in between gates or near feed and water areas. And here's some agricultural extensions talking about it. And it's even sometimes recommended to set your pasture on fire via prescribed burn. All right, so are there any other deaths? Most definitely. The most obvious are deaths associated with protecting cows from predation. According to the Mississippi State Extension, predators include coyotes, dogs, mountain lions, bobcats, cougars, puma, lynx, black vultures, wolves, and bears, and hawks, rattlesnakes, and even fire ants are other species that can cause damage to cattle. All right, now let's get silly. Cows are also very likely going to kill animals in the pasture, especially if we're referring to invertebrates. Think insects, arachnids, etc. Invertebrates are all over the place, they're small, and relative to animals like humans and especially cows, they're pretty fragile. In fact, this article from smithsonian.edu cites two studies showing 124 million and 425 million invertebrates per acre. So let's just take the lower estimate and look at that first study. And also just consider the bugs above the soil. This gives us about 1,850 bugs per square foot. 1,850. And just for reference, an 18-inch computer monitor is about the same area as a square foot. Now this isn't a forest, and it is a study from the 1940s, but the broad point is, bugs are small, and there's a lot of them on the ground. Probably more than you think. All right, now according to this article where they strapped pedometers on cows, yep, they really did do that apparently. They found that on average, they took about 12,000 steps a day. So let's take that and multiply by two to get the total footfalls per day, then multiply that by an estimation of the days in a cow's life to get an estimate of the lifetime footfalls. Then let's say every 20 footfalls kills a single bug. That would give us about this many invertebrates killed by the cow in their lifetime. But if we think there's 10 invertebrates killed every footfall, then we get this many invertebrates killed by the cow in their lifetime. 
So what's a likely number of bugs killed per footfall? Well, I'm sure it depends on all sorts of things like compaction and moisture of soil, time of year, local invertebrate populations, etc. But we're talking huge animals weighing hundreds of pounds with hard hooves. And remember, when we're talking bugs in the grass, we're not talking grass that looks like a suburban lawn. We're talking pasture that looks like this. If you've ever mowed a lawn when it got to even a fraction of that length, I'm sure you've seen bugs flying everywhere. Also, remember how all the big heavy farm equipment with giant wheels had to go over the hayfield like five times? I wonder if that killed any bugs. And then of course, remember earlier when the Texas Extension said cows would need to eat 11,000 pounds of dry matter forage over the course of a year? So like 22,000 pounds for two years? Do we think there's gonna be very many bugs in that amount of grass? If we look at some average masses of bugs and then assume one one thousandth of the weight of forage is made up of invertebrates that didn't escape the cow's teeth, then these are the number of bugs killed over the course of a single cow's lifetime. And those numbers are pretty big even if we assume one ten thousandth of the weight of forage. And then remember we multiply that number by roughly two cows. All right, now I generally take it that when someone invokes crop deaths and starts talking about more downstream and indirect deaths, we're in the realm of consequentialism, utilitarianism, etc. I say this because this specific rebuttal I'm about to give might strike some of you as far out or weird or something. But if you're talking consequentialism, this is the stuff you talk about. So with that in mind, we have to consider the cost difference in eating nothing but grass-fed cow compared to the cost of eating nothing but wheat, lentils, or soybeans for a year. So just to make this quick, I looked at prices of whole wheat flour, lentils, soybeans, grass-fed ground cow, and grass-fed steak at Target. Target, since targets are fairly ubiquitous in the US. I then took the total calories someone would eat in a year based off 2400 calories a day, divided that by the calories per each unit or container, and then multiplied that by the cost per unit. And here are the yearly costs for each. So based on this, we're looking at at least a $5,000 savings per year, if we compare the most expensive vegan option with the grass-fed ground cow. But not all cow is gonna be ground up. Some of them will be cut into steaks, which is significantly more expensive. And as you can see, wheat is way less expensive than even lentils or soybeans. So this number is actually even larger, but let's just say 5,000 for now to keep it simple. All right, cool, you saved some money. Why is that important? Because money can spare lives. According to an estimate from Animal Charity Evaluators in 2018, $1,000 would spare an average of 3,500 animals. So $5,000 could spare 17,500 animals, mostly chickens. And since we're talking about crop deaths, it also prevents all those crop deaths from happening that would have been associated with feeding those 17,000 chickens. So it seems to me this number of deaths is essentially impossible to catch up to if we're comparing it to one seventh of an acre of soybean field, especially since the chickens alone would have eaten far more than one seventh of an acre of crops. Now, of course, these estimates are subject to all sorts of problems, but even if we think it's off by a factor of 10, that would still be 1,750 chickens plus all the crop deaths from the crops they ate. But we don't have to get bogged down in overly reductive animal saved calculations. The point is that money can be used in myriad ways. It could go to local animal sanctuaries, it could be invested in cultured or plant-based meat alternatives, or go towards something like the AFA, which seeks to lobby the government, or go to outreach programs like ASAP or We the Free. And if we wanna get really cute with this argument, we might even say that utilitarian non-vegans should still take the soy, lentil, and wheat approach. Since according to GiveWell.com, 3,500 to $5,500 is about enough to save a human life. Another thing to consider is all the cows and calves that die before ever having the honor of being ground up for human consumption. According to this USDA study, almost 9% of cows were lost due to things like respiratory problems, old age, weather-related events, and predators, approximating 3.9 million total animals to the tune of almost $4 billion. So assuming grass-fed and grain-fed cows have similar losses, you might be able to tack another roughly 8 to 9% onto all the previous death count figures from earlier. And then of course, there's all the destruction and death that comes from climate change related events. But I talk about that at length in the previous video, which is linked in the description. Now for this video and for my other two videos on the subject, I've taken the idea seriously that vertebrates getting hit by combines is some sort of major problem. But as Mark Middleton of Animal Visuals points out, there's two other studies that don't show any significant mortality rate caused by harvesting, one in Argentina and one in South Dakota. But hey, maybe you don't trust studies. You want some good old fashioned anecdotes from a salt of the earth farmer. Well, remember that Reddit thread I showed earlier? Here's a bunch of posters expressing this same sentiment. Dr. Zhivago says, I've only ever witnessed rabbits, pheasants, and deer running away from the combine, not an actual strike. While male farmer says, my combine kills a lot of grasshoppers, but to my knowledge, I have never killed an animal, big or small. We run small grains combines and putting an animal through it would be noticeable and cause damage. And Shooter McGavin says, yep, we killed loads of grasshoppers with our combines. Maybe once every three or four years, you get a porcupine or wound a fawn. Now we do have stinker must say deers, turkeys, lots of rabbits, coyotes, skunk, lots of animals like hide in hay. But here's the problem. 
he's talking about hay. And it's not as if crop farming is some static thing where we can't achieve improvements and innovation. There's low and no-till agriculture, which has become more popular in recent years. There's soil solarization, perennial grains, veganic farming, indoor farming, including vertical farming, use of contraceptives to control rodent populations, potential innovations in AI. What AI is great at is telling the difference between things. In this case, the difference between chard and a weed, and then killing the weeds with lasers. Mike Sell expects AI will allow robots to work in fields and factories in entirely new ways. The capabilities are too great, and and the wave is only starting right now. And as Lamy says in his book, Duty and the Beast, where killing was once the default option to limit agricultural damage caused by geese, cranes, and swans, contemporary methods now involve non-lethal practices such as scaring campaigns, diversionary fields, and refuge sites. So overall, did these claims pass the sniff test? Well, considering the original incarnation of the argument was so thoroughly and swiftly debunked after its inception, the fact that many grass-fed cows eat hay that's been mowed by heavy machinery, tetted by heavy machinery, raked by heavy machinery, baled by heavy machinery, and moved around by heavy machinery, probably representing an amount of land alone greater than a calorically comparable amount of crops, the fact that hay presents a fire hazard, the fact that pesticides are sometimes used on both pasture and cows themselves, the fact that cows need to be protected from predators. The fact that cows likely step on and eat tons of bugs. The fact that you could use the money saved from not buying grass-fed cows to spare animals in a more indirect sense. The fact that many cows just die from things like weather, disease, and predation before they can ever become human calories. And climate change considerations? I'd say they didn't pass. They didn't pass the sniff test. And just to add insult to injury, remember earlier when I said soybeans produced about 6 million calories per acre? Well, the first Google search option actually cites this University of Illinois source that puts that at more like 8 million calories. But it gets even worse. You can also double crop soybeans with wheat, meaning during the winter months when soy isn't growing, you can grow wheat on that same land. And when you do that, you get more like 13 million calories per acre. So just think back, if we compare that to the estimates from the University of Texas Extension, one cow over two years and three acres gets you around 500,000 calories. If you double cropped wheat and soybeans for two years on three acres, you'd get 82 million calories, or about 164 times more calories. So if I had three acres and I double cropped for two years, I'd get 82 million calories. Using that same amount of land, I'd have to raise grass-fed cows for the next 328 years. That would be like me starting in 1695, before the internet, before penicillin, before the US was even its own country, and then farming cows all the way up until present day. So that's 164 cows, plus all the animals dying from all the other stuff we talked about, for 328 years. Again, that's a lot to catch up to. And it brings us back to something else. Remember when we talked about owls killing mice and how to factor that in? Well, no matter if it's crop, pasture, or wildland, there will be animals dying and suffering on it. But efficient cropping uses the least land. Meaning the more crops we eat, the more latitude we have to use that other land in whichever way makes the most sense. And while currently that may mean mostly rewilding as a means of mitigating climate change and ecological collapse, in the future, this will allow us to create land with the least suffering and death. And depending on our technology and what we do with that land, perhaps virtually no suffering and death. And if you want to help me make this my full-time career, check out the Patreon in the description. And shout out to Ryan O'Neill, Tom Eisenweiss, Nutbase News, Monstar, David Yastrzemski, and Maxwell Edison.